Hi, students. We're in week 14, and uh, we're going to approach kind of a, a sensitive topic uh, this week. It's uh, chapter 12, Coping with Death, Dying, and uh, Bereavement. Okay, and so let me pull up the uh, PowerPoint for this week so we can talk about this very sensitive uh, topic. Okay, we've just been through a pandemic. Uh, and things have not been so good uh, for many of us uh, in terms of our, you know, uh, families and relatives who have lost their lives due to this, uh, this pandemic. And uh, it's been very difficult, right, uh, to read about all of the losses that we had um, occurring during this period and, uh, and even afterward, okay? So... <clears throat> All of us have probably experienced some loss, maybe a pet, right, or or a family member. I remember in my own life that uh, uh, my parents passed away when I was uh, eight years old and then nine years old. So, you know, one, one year after the other. So it was very difficult for me being a child and experiencing the loss of uh, people who were so very close to me, okay? And I think that's affected my life uh, all the way till now because I s still experience their loss. Uh, and I've tried to make up for the losses uh, by being an overachiever, I guess. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of been my life experience. And I'm sure that many of you who have... Uh, gone through losses have uh, coped in various ways and we're going to talk about that in this lecture today okay so we're in chapter 12 again uh, coping with death dying and bereavement this is a photo um, that i took from our house in the philippines um, that shows a uh, funeral procession okay and so in the philippines they uh you know, come from the church and they have, a, you know, a van or a truck loaded with the, uh, the loved one going to the cemetery. And then uh, the relatives and the, uh, you know, family uh, follow in a procession on foot. Okay. And so right here, they're walking through the, uh, the small town and going to the cemetery where the person will be put to rest. Okay. All right, let's talk about death and dying. Um, most deaths uh, that we come across uh, occur after a long, you know, kind of illness period, okay, or incidents of frailty. And, and so we kind of predict that at some point the person will pass away, okay? So these are predictable deaths. Um, and usually these are deaths of older adults um, or you know people who have had had chronic health conditions and so these are rather predictable and we can prepare as family members uh, and friends you know for the uh, loss however uh, in other cases there are unpredictable death events that can occur at any time in life okay and so um, I remember my mother uh, had uh, had a collision at a gas pump, okay? And back then, those visors that you use to kind of shield your eyes from the sun were, uh, you know, made out of steel and then some leather on top. She hit her forehead on the uh, steel there, and that caused uh, blood to... Uh, accumulate in her brain and she passed away the next morning from an aneurysm so this was a, a an unpredictable death for for our family or a small family uh, and then the next year my father passed away from lung cancer because uh, you know he had been in the world war and then afterward had uh, you know been exposed to lots of paint uh, that they were using to restore, um, you know, various uh, uh, vehicles and things like that. And then he was also a lifelong smoker, and he was only 44. My mom was uh, 36 at the time, 
And so he passed away, but it was kind of predictable because he started uh, having a chronic illness related to his uh, lungs. And we knew that at some point he would pass away, okay? So these are both unpredictable and predictable deaths that I'm giving examples about, okay? Now in your book, there is this really old theory uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, stages that we go through uh, for the grieving process concerning the loss of a loved one. And so these are, this theory was set up for um, uh, predictable deaths, okay? And uh, Kubler-Ross wrote a book in 1979, okay, that explained what she had come across as a clinician um, related to uh, kind of, um, I don't know, stages that people go through when they confront uh, their grief in terms of death and dying. Now, that, that theory has been debunked for some time because we don't go through all the stages that she describes in the book. And sometimes we go through um, uh, the stages differently if we do experience them at all. And so I put a link here at the bottom of this slide, and it talks about, uh, you know, a transcript of a radio show from NPR uh, that, that talks about these five stages and, and kind of critiques those, okay? So read what's in the book about Cooper Ross's ideas, and then listen to this, uh, or watch, read, I guess, this uh, transcript of the radio show and you'll get some idea about um, you know how Kubler Ross's ideas about the grieving process have been uh, sort of out of favor for some time okay now your book also talks about euthanasia now remember the concepts that I present in this lecture will probably be quiz material so you want to make sure that you read that Kubler Ross uh, those ideas about the uh, grieving process, and then also read in your book about euthanasia, okay? Now, some people suffer from a terminal illness and they want to have um, either the family or the physician in their life because they're suffering so much, okay? From either a terminal illness or severe disability. And so there are two types, two main types of euthanasia. Uh, one is an active type where we intentionally cause the death through some lethal dose of medication. And then there's passive kinds of euthanasia where we withdraw uh, life support. So removing a respirator or a feeding tube or some kind of machine that keeps the uh, person living. Okay, so that's a passive type of euthanasia. Now, currently, there are about nine states plus D.C. and Canada and several European countries that allow uh, physicians to assist in the death process. Um, but, you know, for some time, there's been legal, ethical, religious opinions weighing in on this issue. And so it's really, a, it's been a controversial issue for some time. And you might wanna think about that and read the section in the book on euthanasia and understand its implications, okay? Now, when we talk about the loss of loved ones, we also think about the survivors, okay? The people who still live after the loved one has passed away. Uh, now, you know uh, that there are various kinds of uh, practices that we have concerning uh, rituals that we go through uh, when loved ones pass away or friends, okay? And so religion plays a big role in the way we treat um, the loss of a loved one or a friend, okay? Um, I know in the Jewish tradition, they like to, uh, you know, bury uh, the dead as quickly as possible. But in other uh, religions, like Christian religions, 
um, you know, the ritual goes on for some time, a week or two weeks, uh, making sure that all of the loved ones that were in the family are able to, you know, come and uh, experience um, the loss uh, together. Okay, so I guess Christian burials take a little more time than, uh, than other religions in uh, coming to the conclusion of the burial. Okay, now a new trend in the U.S. and in other countries is something called the green burial. Okay, um, not using concrete and uh, and sometimes steel caskets. Okay, to bury the dead in plots in a cemetery, but the green burial is kind of like a natural burial, and it reduces impacts on the environment. Okay, so it eliminates the concrete and the wood, the embalming fluids, the copper, bronze, etc., that's used in traditional kinds of burials. And this helps to reduce the cost of the burial and it also helps the environment. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, uh, in terms of survivors uh, coping, I'm going to talk about that in some at some length here in a minute, uh, but uh, there are kind of three things that go with coping with death of a loved one. Uh, you grieve, okay, that's the natural, normal process of reacting to the loss. Then there's something called bereavement, and that's the period in which grief and mourning occur, okay? And then there's the mourning uh, aspect of coping with death, and that's adapting to the loss. Okay, so these are all processes that we go through when we lose some loved one. Okay. Now, uh, something that I research is not only coping with the loss of a loved one and the coping methods that people use uh, when they deal with uh, the death of a loved one, but also how do emotions play a part in. Uh, in memory to make sure that you get through this grieving process and bereavement process um, and come to some um, final um, you know conclusion uh, emotionally concerning the death event okay or other uh, events like natural disasters right and, and other traumatic losses that we experience in life okay that's what i study and you can see, you know, that I had the experience of losing loved ones at an early time in my life. And my research kind of, uh, you know, looks at that because it's still kind of an, um, I don't know, it's something that affects me even, you know, uh, in late middle age. All right. Now, there's something called the fading affect bias. And I've been studying this since uh, I was an associate professor. Uh, with a colleague of mine uh, named uh, Walker, Dr. Walker, who's now at Colorado State. But we were at the same institution in North Carolina together, and we um, conducted lots of research that had to do with this topic, okay? Now, not mentioned in this chapter is uh, that fading affect bias, and I'm just going to explain it so you understand what the concept means, okay? So, we always try in our lives to kind of maintain a positive, a slightly positive bias in our emotions on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can face life and face, um, you know, events, unexpected or predicted events that happen in our lives. Uh, and so we have this kind of constant state of a little bit of positivity when we go into our everyday uh, living. And um, we want to know, you know, about negative and positive memories and extremely negative memories, like the loss of a loved one, through violent or nonviolent means, okay? And what happens to those emotions over time? That's what we've studied. Um, we started out by looking at the African-American culture and then the Filipino culture and now we just finished a, a study on the Mexican culture and how emotions play a part in the way we deal with uh, 
negative memories. Okay, so the fading affect bias is actually a phenomenon where uh, positive memory emotional intensity stays relatively stable over time. So you can think of marriages and graduations and birth of children and things like that that have caused us to have really positive kinds of emotions that are attached to memories that we have formed. And that positive intensity, the emotional intensity stays pretty stable over time, over the years, okay? So it's nice that we have positive memories and that we can feel the uh, positive emotions associated with those events uh, for a long period of time over our lives, okay? And it helps us to keep this positivity, uh, positivity bias over time. However, with negative memories, you can think that at the time the event occurred when we formed a memory about, uh, you know, some kind of traumatic event like uh, the loss of loved ones, it was extremely negatively intense for us, okay? But the strange thing is that over time, um, that emotional intensity associated with that original um, traumatic event fades away, okay? And so we don't feel as uh, emotionally intense about negative experiences or memories after years, okay, or after time. Uh, because if we did, we would, um, you know, probably experience depression and other things, okay? And we would be uh, just uh, approaching life in a very negative kind of mindset, okay? So the fading affect bias predicts that people who have positive memories will uh, sustain the positive emotional intensity over time and the negative memories that we uh, experience uh, the emotional intensity uh, associated with those memories will fade over time, okay? And that allows us to kind of cope with negative situations that we experience in life. All right, so the first uh, large project that we did had to do with African Americans' memories of uh, violent and nonviolent death, all right? And there were over 100 participants in that study. And we found that 25% of that sample had actually experienced the violent loss of loved ones, okay, either through shooting or, or stabbing or uh, other kinds of really violent experiences, okay, and so they wrote memories about those experiences in, in the study. And then three quarters of the uh, participants uh, reported kind of nonviolent deaths, so illnesses and other kinds of predictable um, death events in, in the study. We looked at the words that people used when they wrote about uh, these memories, okay, either of violent loss or nonviolent loss. And then we looked at the coping methods that African Americans used to get through these traumatic experiences. Okay, they did uh, show when they rated their emotional intensity about an event in the past, that negative emotional intensity faded and positive emotional intensity stayed relatively stable over time. Okay, so that did show the fading epic bias. In the Philippines, uh, when I went to do that study, we went to the central islands in the Philippines and we had uh, 49 participants in that study, and they described verbally um, some positive and some negative memories, but also uh, memories about the loss of a loved one. And so this was kind of a within subjects uh, study, if you study research methods, where we had them describe a couple of positive memories, a negative memory, and the memory for the loss of a loved one. Okay. So we coded the violent uh, memories and then we coded nonviolent memories and we didn't find as many violent memories um, expressed in the study as with African-Americans. So there were only 15% of the participants who had experienced the loss of a loved one through violent means. 
And then there were 85% who uh, you know, reported the loss of a loved one through some kind of illness, okay, or expected death, predicted death. We did not find uh, the FAB in the study for Filipinos who um, were rating their emotions at the time of a, a loss of a loved one. And now they held on to the negative emotional intensity for the loss of loved ones. And we found by exploring the culture that they believed uh, that, you know, uh, family members or ancestors uh, who had passed away still kind of exist in spirit, uh, you know, either around their house or where they had passed away. So they had these kind of indigenous beliefs that made them think that their ancestors or loved ones were still kind of walking the earth in spirit form. And so this is called animism when you think that, uh, you know, objects or places or uh, other things are kind of, uh, they have some kind of living force, okay? And so the people in the central Philippines had these kinds of beliefs kind of intermixed with uh, their majority Catholic uh, kind of views on uh, on uh, the death, deaths of loved ones, and uh, etc. Okay, so they did not show any fading for the memories of loss of loved ones over time, and that was kind of unexpected for us. But it's a cultural kind of a you know cue or clue to us that uh, in different cultures, people um, experience emotions differently when they lose loved ones, okay? So it's, it was really interesting. Now we uh, submitted and we are rewriting a paper dealing with uh, Mexicans' loss of loved ones. And we had nearly 200 participants in the study. It was cut, conducted online during the pandemic, okay? From various regions of Mexico. And we found that although fading affect bias was shown for negative memories, just everyday memories that have to deal with negative events, that showed a, a really strong fading affect bias over time, that the loss of loved ones, although it was significantly different over time, was a little bit less than just everyday memories, okay? And so this was an unexpected kind of a, a, a conclusion that we had in our research in Mexico, all right? Now, we didn't really study the effects or the cultural practices or beliefs or anything like that concerning the loss of loved ones. And so we can't say that, you know, there are indigenous beliefs in Mexico that affect the way people uh, respond to the deaths of loved ones. But it was an interesting result, and we'll probably have to do some more research, as we always do, because when you do research, there are always new questions that you have to answer in subsequent studies, okay? And so uh, I think it's really interesting to uh, investigate this fading affect bias in various cultures so we get an idea of how people deal uh, with emotions, right, uh, surrounding deaths. Okay, well, there is enough for you uh, this week. I just wanted to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about what's in the book and then also talk a little bit about my own research concerning uh, the loss of loved ones. I know it's a dark topic. It's difficult to think about, but I hope that, uh, you know, you guys are okay and and able to get through this uh, lecture, okay, without too much, uh, too much grief, okay. All right. Well, have a good week. I know that uh, we. Uh, let me just check the syllabus real quick, the tentative course schedule, to see where we're at. Um, we're here in week fourteen. The next week, week fifteen, uh, I'm going to have you contact me if you want to uh, get some. Um, extra uh, information about uh, about the uh, the project concerning uh, 
the interviews. Okay, so all right, here it is now. All right, we're in week 14, week 15. Call or email me to do a Zoom meeting if you need help on your interview research assignments. And, you know, if you've written a rough draft or something like that, or you have materials associated with the interviews, um, have those ready before we meet if you need a meeting. Okay, if you don't need a meeting, you don't need to contact me. Uh, just go ahead and get everything ready. And the due date is shown here. It's a 75 point assignment, and it, it is your kind of final project for the course. Okay, so next week there will be no lecture. But remember, if you need help on this interview assignment, contact me and I'll walk you through what you need to do to finish it successfully, okay? Then uh, in week 16, I'm just gonna post a short lecture that talks about uh, kind of closing thoughts related to the psychology of adult development. And then you'll do course evaluations uh, for my teaching uh, in this course. And that will be it, okay? So we are really close to the end mark of this course. Of course, we do have this project this week, uh, or not a project, but a quiz and a discussion, right? So you wanna get those out of the way and then focus all of your attention on this final uh, written assignment project on the interview, okay? All right, very good. You guys have a great rest of the week and I will uh, see you uh, in week 16 when I post a lecture on closing thoughts, okay? Thank you, bye-bye.